thinking about VBS uh, and going over uh, the sermon themes, we have a, a wonderful scribal team during the week that I think uh, is rare in churches with a pastoral staff uh, to have a scribal theme that goes over the uh, message uh, before uh, we preach it on Sunday or go with a series of messages before we preach them. We have an exegetical team that goes through the Word of God on Tuesdays, led by Pastor Josh. So all the pastors get together around the table, and we discuss uh, the passage for the week. And as a result of their reasoning and their conclusions, uh, we pray and we ask the Lord to guide us. And so we preach that message. But the messages that you hear Pastor preach, I I'm thankful, and I want to thank all of them right here from the pulpit for the great work that they do preparing um, the messages and, and then giving us the themes. And then from there, we, we take it to prayer and then we develop the message for that Sunday. And so I just want you to know the kind of hard work that goes behind the scenes um, to keep this, this, um, this body, this community of over 3,000 people during the week um, prepared with the word of the Lord. So one of our great things is to bring the word of God to you so that we could actually be called a Bible church uh, because we, we preach the word of God. You hear the word of God day in, day out on Sundays and on Wednesday nights and throughout the week. Um, and so we, we were thinking about, well, what should we do? And for this Sunday, we thought that it would be good to, to you know, uh, preach a sermon that's re related to VB, VB, VBS. Vacation Bible School that's related to uh, bringing kids in and teaching them the word and, and ministering to our kids and not babysitting the babies but singing songs to them about Jesus. So that at the end of the day, uh, the children that come through these halls uh, throughout this coming week, which is a powerful week in the life of the Mission Ebenezer community, this is one of the most powerful weeks that, that we have throughout the year, which is a, a week where children come to know Jesus, period. I know, you know, it doesn't sound exciting to say come to know Jesus, but you'd be surprised what happens when a child comes to know Jesus at a very early age. Never underestimate the faith of a child because the faith of a child is the foundation and the building blocks of their virtue and, 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 and of their priorities and of the life that they will lead someday. Uh, it, 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 when a child comes to know Jesus at an early age, it's very likely that they will continue to maintain that faith even as they grow older. So don't ever est underestimate it. You know, get, you get into some conversations with some of our children, and they're they're theologians already. They're talking about creation, and and they're talking about. Um, uh, who made the world and who made trees? And I mean, you ask them who made cars, they go, Jesus. You know, they're, they're, they're indoctrinated. And that's what we want. Don't you want that for your children? Don't you want that for the children of our culture? Don't you want that for the children of our society? Don't you think we need more respect in our streets? Don't you think we need more godliness in the hallways of Washington? Guess where it starts? And you look at Washington and you say somebody didn't hear about Jesus when they were in primary school. Somebody didn't hear about the Lord when they were growing up. They heard about money. They heard about stocks and bonds. But they didn't hear about Jesus. And I'm telling you, there's nothing more important in this world than Jesus. Don't give me gold. Don't give me silver. Don't give me riches. Give me Jesus. But you can't even enjoy your riches if you don't have Jesus. You know, what's the use in being in a position of power when you can't even enjoy the power that you have? You follow me? You can't even enjoy your relevance or popularity. Why? Because you're not founded on biblical principles. Amen? So VBS, we're going to teach our children about Jesus early. You never know where. Out of our VBS, we might get a president of the United States someday that's rooted on the rock of ages. We might get a senator. We might get a congresswoman. We might get a doctor with compassion in their hearts. Everybody listening? 
We, we might get a police that serves the Lord with an iron fist, but with a silk glove on the other hand. Is everybody listening to me? Does everybody understand then why it's so important to have VBS? No? It's the most important thing in the world this week. And so uh, that said, uh, we picked a theme that is related to children. And the theme is out of 2 Kings chapter 5, verses 1 through 14. 2 Kings chapter 5. It's an awesome little story about a little slave girl. 2 Kings chapter 5. When you say it, say amen if you have it. Say, I got it, pastor. You got it? All right, this is a great story. And, and uh, I'm going to give this story this title. The little Hebrew slave. Everybody say the little Hebrew slave. And some of you young parents out there, what you want to do is you want to bring up your children in God's ways. Amen. Can I hear an amen out there? You want to bring up your children in God's ways. I mean, if you bring up your children in God's ways, you're going to get headaches anyway. Right. But if you don't bring them up in God's ways, you're going to lose your head. Right. I'd rather have a headache. So let's bring up our children in God's ways. Young parents can't do worse than bring up your children, bringing them to church, learning about the Lord. Is everybody listening? Yes. All right, here, here goes the story. Hey, this is a really cool story, so pay attention. Now Naaman, everybody say Naaman. Naaman. Now Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria. Commander of the army of the king of Syria. In other words, he was a five-star general. He was a great and honorable man in the eyes of his master, the king. In other words, the king trusted him. The king admired this great, great hero. The king looked up to his own general because by Naaman, the Lord had given victory to Syria. Is everybody listening? By Naaman, are you listening? It was by Naaman that the Lord had given victory to who? Now, Syria is not even Israel. You got to first of all, stop and think about that. Syria is not God's chosen people. Syria is not the Jewish people. We know that God, from time immemorial, had been the Lord of Israel. Is everybody listening? He's the God of Israel. But you need to pay attention to this. God is also the Lord of the nations. Believe me, Putin is not there because Putin wants to be there. Believe me, Putin is there because God allowed Putin to be there. Amen. You are what? Yeah, don't ask God questions. Our president is not there because everybody voted him in. That had part to do with it. Mr. Trump is there because God has allowed him to be there. You deal with that. Okay? God has allowed it. And so God is the Lord of Syria. He gave Syria victory over their enemies. He was also, now here's Naaman. Let's go back to the story. Is everybody following me? Are you following me? He was also a mighty man of valor. Didn't everybody hear that? He, he wasn't just a general that stood at the back of battle and commanded his colonels and lieutenants and captains to go out to battle. He went to battle in front of the battle lines to gain victory like Alexander the Great or like Napoleon Bonaparte, like George Washington. They don't lead from behind. They lead from in front. You could tell a great leader because a leader leads from in front, not from behind. Cowards lead from behind. But Naaman was not a coward. He had battle wounds on his body. He was a conquering hero. He was noble. He was mighty. He was great. Can you imagine now why the king admired him? But watch this. But what was he? A leper. Everybody say leper. He was a leper. Everybody knows what leprosy is? A leprosy is a disease. And without getting too graphic, in leprosy, it won't be long before you start losing your fingers at their joints. 
Um, you can even lose your nose or not to be too graphic, you could lose different body parts. Uh, leprosy is a, a, a rampant, horrible disease that's almost controlled today, but not quite. We still have leper colonies around the world. It's not controlled in, in India. And so it's a horrible, devastating disease. Everybody's heard about leprosy in the, remember leprosy in the Old Testament, what the Word of God says about leprosy? That the person that was a leper was a social outcast, peripheralized, marginalized from the love of the community, from the love of family, and from the love of, of the people of God. They were ostracized. Uh, remember that the lepers that Jesus healed, Remember, Jesus healed 10 lepers one time. Does everybody remember that? Yeah. Jesus healed 10 lepers, but the, the lepers had to stay outside of Jerusalem. They couldn't come into the city to have social intercourse with their family, with their wives, with their people, with anybody. They had to stand uh, 30 yards away from civilization, and if anybody ever came close to a leper, they had to yell out loud, unclean, unclean, unclean. So this is uh, Naaman, but Naaman had a special uh, uh, understanding with the king. But everybody knew he was a leper. So can you imagine when General Naaman came into a room that this was an iron. As he walked into the room, everybody knows he was a great general, but do you think anybody would go up and hug him? Excuse me? No. He was a social outcast. He was an untouchable. It's what they call the lepers in India. The minute he walked into a room, he threw everyone into a paradoxical quandary. This is the greatest general of all time. Yeah, but guess what? He's a leper. And the Syrians had gone out on raids and had brought back captive a little girl is the translation from Hebrew. A little girl. And I would add about uh, 10 to 11 years of age. They kidnapped her from Israel. She waited on Naaman's wife. They brought her in. I don't know what happened to her parents. Uh, they might have killed her parents. Her parents might have fled. They might have been uh, destroyed. Uh, or they may have bought her from the parents. Who knows? But they brought this precious, beautiful, little Israelite girl. The prettiest thing you'd ever want to imagine. They brought her kidnapped. They didn't hurt her, but they brought her to serve Naaman's wife. The general's wife. She brought her slippers. After her bath, he probably brushed her hair. She brought her hair clips. She helped her, and she knew what was going on in that household. She knew how to take care of Naaman's linens, the dirty linens with blood. She knew the grief that his wife went through. She knew the pain, because as she brushed her mistress's hair, they would talk. That's how much they loved this little baby girl. And she was wise beyond her years. Did you know children are wise? You know, we're not in trouble, they're wise. You know what I mean? They ask questions you won't believe. You know, children are that way? Remember one time uh, I was a, a, a philosophy teacher in college. Philosophy 101A. The title of the book, that was 35 years, 36, 37 years ago. The title of the book was An Introduction to the History of Philosophy. The author's name was Enoch Stumpf. The book was published in 1976 out of New York, Chicago, and San Francisco, McGraw-Hill Press. It was chapter four in the book, haven't seen it in that many years, chapter four in the book, and it was called uh, The Pythagorean Theory of Geometry. And, and Pythagoras, of course, was a mathematician and a philosopher. 
and he had picked up an equation by Anaximander, another great Greek mathematician and philosopher, and uh, that said this, that I was trying to teach my, my students that reality as we know it is really not the ultimate reality because, I mean, reality as we know it could be argued, arguably an illusion. Is everybody following, Pastor? An illusion, right? An illusion of the mind for the survival of the mind. That solids, that contingency and space, time and memory are illusions for the survival of the human mind. You follow me? Because there's really no such thing as time. And there's no such thing as distance. For example, I said to my students, if a horse leaves the gate at the horse track, before he gets to the halfway point, he has to pass the quarter point. Before he passes the quarter point, he has to pass the one-eighth point. Before he passes the one-eighth point, he has to pass the what? The 16th. Come on, mathematicians. Before he goes past the 16th point, he has to pass what? The 32nd. Before he passes the 32nd, he has to pass what? The 64th. Before he passes the 64th, he had to pass what? 138. Therefore, the horse never really left. Because you could go on arguing that ad infinitum. Right? You follow what I'm saying? Children are really smart. So we cannot underestimate their faith. Is that clear? We cannot underestimate the faith of any child that goes through our VBS this week. They may be the salvation of their home. They may be the reason why their alcoholic father will come to know the Lord. They may be the reason why their uncle might serve Jesus. They may be the reason why their mama comes to know Jesus and comes to church. We have people here today. We have a family here today that's here because their babies gave their heart to Christ. Then mama came to Christ. Then the family came to Christ. How many of you know that this church stands on the history that families came to know Jesus because we had Sunday school class for the children on Sunday. And that's how mama came. Because mama comes to, she wants to know what her kid is up to. Mom and dad, they want to know where their kids are going. Do you know that's right? And so you never underestimate, and you don't underestimate this little girl's faith right here. The Syrians had brought her back, and she waited on Naaman's wife. Here's a story, verse 3. Then she said to her mistress, if only my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria. Praise God. The prophet then was named Elisha. Everybody say Elisha. Elisha. If only... My master were with the prophet. If only he would go visit the prophet. Remember that? Why? Because the prophet signified that there was healing in Israel. The prophet signified that there was a balm in Gilead to make the sin sick free. The prophet signified that the power of God was there to heal. Who is the prophet? Jesus Christ is prophet and king and priest. There's healing in the name of Jesus. You don't have to go to an idol temple. All you got to do is have faith in Jesus Christ and you will be healed. You will be healed in your body. You'll be healed in your mind and your spirit. Addictions will be lifted. Bruises will be healed. Wounds will be bound. Sin will be forgiven because there's healing and salvation in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. There's healing in Israel. There's healing in the house of God. Everybody know that? Oh, isn't this story getting good? No? He said if he went to Samaria, he would heal him of his leprosy. Oh, my Lord. Do you see the faith in this little 10-year-old? Did she say he might heal him? Well, let me ask you again. Did she say he might heal him? Did she say probably heal him? Did she say it's just good for them to be friends? No. Unwavering, unwavering faith without any doubt whatsoever. The faith that Jesus talked about when he said, if you have the faith, the sign of a, the size of a grain of mustard seed, you shall say to this mountain, be thou removed and the mountain will be removed. For with faith, nothing is impossible with God. 
Do you have faith for God to heal you? Do you have faith for God to forgive you? Do you have faith for God to do that which you're praying for that seems impossible for you? Believe me, friend, there's nothing impossible for the God that you came in here to worship today. There's not a thing impossible for the God that you came in here to witness today. You see this book? It's all about faith. Don't get bored with this book, friend. This book has a strength you need to be delivered. And everybody has the, needs deliverance. Did you know that? Do you know everybody in here is a spiritual leper? And we need to be delivered from our leprosy, whether it's bitterness, greed, hatred, pride, prejudice, hatred. Separate children from their parents. Separate 3,000 children from their parents. Put babies in care centers and separate their mom and send them back to El Salvador so you can never reunite them again because you separated them. That's leprosy. Right? Hating President Trump, that's leprosy. God didn't call us to hate nobody. You could love him, but you don't have to like him. We respect the institution that God has placed. That's another message. I'm not going to preach on that message. I just want to preach on this one. There's nothing impossible if you believe that there's healing in Israel. There's nothing impossible for you if you have faith. God's got the power. Is that clear? Everybody say, if you have faith, God's got the power. And she had faith, didn't she? She said, look what the little girl said. This week. Then she said, for, for he would heal him of his leprosy. Now, how did she know Elisha's mind? She didn't have to know the mind of Elisha. Because she knew the mind of who? He knew the mind of God. And she knew that God could use Naaman in a mighty way. Did you know that? Did you know this whole story is not about that? Uh, uh, Naaman got healed. Did you know what? Let's read the rest of the story. You all know what I'm talking about. Then she said to her, there's healing in Israel. And Naaman went in and told his master saying, what does that mean? That means that the, the lady of the house took the cheeseman to her husband and her husband took the cheeseman to the king. And Naaman went in and told the king saying, thus and thus said this little girl, who is from the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, go right now, man. Go while the going's good. Go right now. And the king of Syria said, but, and, and I'll send a letter, I'll send a personal letter with the stamp and seal of the king to the king of Israel. So Naaman left Syria and took with him ten talents of silver. 6,000 shekels of gold. Oh, my Lord. Ten changes of clothing. Oh, my God. That's enough to break Fort Knox. So, you know, he had a chain of camels. Can, can you believe how much that weighed? How much? Some, and somebody told me it was like $2 million today. Somebody said it was too much. I, I really don't know. I didn't take out the calculation. Did you guys, Josh? $2.3 million? $2.75 million dollars worth of gold and silver and and spools of silk that uh how many of you guys have a very nice suit anybody have a silk suit i don't like silk because it sticks to me so i, I get polyester over at uh, 90 day what's it called three day brokers <laughs> I, I one of the ladies from church spanish church works at three day brokers so i'm not embarrassed already i've heard like t measuring my body my deformed body. <laughs> no, seriously. She was measuring me and she ran out of tape on the measure. I, I was embarrassed, man. Plus the tape was orange. And she said, I'll be back. And she came out with a rope. <laughs> Dude, man, I messaged this pastor with a rope. And then had somebody come out and hold the other side. It was embarrassing. I go, uh, Olga, write it down so that next time I come in, you know, you have to pull out that... Uh, that Caltrans rope, colored orange rope. <laughs> I'm serious. 
It's embarrassing, isn't it? Quit lying. She has leprosy. You have a leopard diet. Thus and thus. And so the king, and so he went and he took that money with him. And then he brought the letter to the king. And the, and the king of Syria wrote this right here. Now be advised, Elisha, when this letter comes to you, that I have sent Naaman my servant to you, that you may heal him of his leprosy. I mean, he sent it to the king of Israel. Now be advised. And the king of Israel said, oh man, he thinks I can heal. Is that embarrassing? The king said, man, it's not me, man, it's Elisha. Why are you trying to pick a fight with me? Now I know he's going to pick, you know how kings are suspicious? I know why he sent this, because he knows I can't heal. And when I don't heal him, he's going to come and destroy me. Why are you going to do that? He goes, I can't heal nothing. You know, so he sent Naaman, and it happened when the king of Israel read the letter that he tore his clothes and said, am I God to kill and make alive and heal that this man sends a man to me to heal him of his leprosy? Therefore, please consider this and see how he's trying to pick a fight with me, really. So it was when Elisha, the man of God, everybody say man of God. Man of God. The man of God. I love that word, don't you? Elisha, the man of God. Everybody say, man of God. Man of God. Am I, huh? Therefore, please consider. So it was when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel was in a pickle and had torn his clothes, that he sent a word to the king saying, why have you torn your clothes off? Please, let him come to me and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. Amen? Amen? And you know, first of all, people, does God like to share his glory with anybody? No, sir. God does not like to share his glory with anybody. If God does a miracle in your life, first give the glory to God and then to your doctor. If you have a victory in life, if you're delivered from some besetting sin or besetting problem in your life, if God brings your wife back or your husband back and you're happy with that, give God the glory. If God changes your deal, if God changes your grandpa, if God changes your family, who gets the glory? Give God the glory. Don't give the therapist the glory first. Give God the glory and then say thank you to the therapist. He shall know. How many of you know there's power in the name of Jesus? How many of you know that Jesus can change an impossible situation? Is there power in the name of Jesus? There's power in the name of Jesus. The Naaman went uh, with his horses and his chariot. Ooh, excuse me. Horses and chariot. You know, hey, hey, isn't that impressive? Isn't power impressive? Yeah, yeah, motorcade, man, limo. He had limos lined up, blinking lights, flying the flag of Syria in the front. <laughs> Secret agents. Following him in a long entourage with gold and silver on the camels carrying on. Everybody been on a camel? Uh -uh. If you're heavy, the hump don't feel good. I went to Israel and they said, would you like to ride the camel? No, thank you. I'll ride a taxi. No, no hump. And you know how camels do, huh? And Elisha sent a message and going, oh, my Lord, look at this. Then Naaman, uh, would, would you tell, can anybody say, uh, do you think that Naaman was arrogant? Yes, sir. Do you think he was proud? Lepers, but proud. You want to tell you? You want me to tell you? How about the people that uh, say, like, I don't need Jesus. I'm fine, man. I'm, I'm real fine. I don't have leprosy. You got leprosy all over you. You got leprosy from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet called sin. Sin is leprosy. And sin keeps us from God. We don't want sin, do we? Everybody want to get rid of their sin? That's why I come to church. That's why I trust in Jesus. I want to get rid of my pride. I want to get rid of all those kind of things that separate me from God. And we don't need leprosy, do we? And so here he comes with this. Uh, he was on that camel. Imagine him with a gold crown with, 
you know, all kinds of medals right here, like the Russians. You got all kinds of medals right here, like these big generals. He comes in, Elisha sent a messenger. Elisha sent a messenger to, oh, and he stood at the door of Elisha's house. He came to Elisha's house. He came to the barrio, man. It don't even look right in our barrio to have an entourage there. You're, you're being, man, if you're being in Keystone, we live in a pretty sad neighborhood compared to PV or Beverly Hills. We live, we live in a barrio two, week, two blocks from the church, man. It, it looks weird when there's a prom and there's a limo in front of somebody's house that only has one bedroom. Is that funny or what? Here's a limo sitting in there and all these little three or four cockroaches come walking out with their little dressing gowns on there with hairspray in their hair and spit on their curls. And you come crawling into the limo, don't even look right. And they just spent one whole month of pay to bring the limo there to an ungrateful teenager. I have never seen a Hollywood entourage in my neighborhood. Right? Our minivan is about as hoity-toity as you're going to get without a rim on it. And then, no, but this guy came in. The entourage came in Elisha's house. It was no big thing. It was no palace. It was an adobe structure with an open roof. And, and uh, Elisha was at the top reading the Israel Times. Sucking down a virgin mimosa. There's a word on the side right there. Chilling. Elisha was up there, and his servant comes. <laughs> Come in, Gehazi. He said, what do you want? He goes, oh, dale. You won't believe who's down there. Pancho Villa. He's got, a whole, he got like 20 camels, man. He's got Main Street blocked off. And he wants you to come down now. Uh, go down and tell him um, to go down to the canal right there by Dominguez Street. <laughs> and tell him to get in the canal seven times. What? Well, he said, go down to the Jordan River and dip yourself in the river. How many times? Seven times. Now, you know the Jordan? It comes down from the north of Israel, which is the region of Dan. It pours all its garbage into the Sea of Galilee, comes out the south side of Galilee, down to Beersheba with swollen chickens and dirt and mud and dead horses and bloated cows and flies. And he said to him, go down and bathe oh, what? in that river seven times. Naaman's pride came up. You know what, man? You could be poor, but you could be proud. You know what I mean? One time I walked up to a homeless guy, and I go, he was sitting there just like this. I said, oh, man, this is a good opportunity to be a Christian. I'm feeling, I'm feeling uh, generous today. I'm going to go down there and, you know, so I can come back and tell the church that, you know, I feed the homeless. <laughs> The church, oh, what a man of God my pastor is. He's awesome. Wow, he's got a heart and compassion. Jeez, my pastor, he's so merciful. I went down there. I said, you know, I said, here you go, man. And I was going to give him 50 cents. He goes, keep your money. I said, what? He goes, I don't need your debt. I asked for it. Oh, oh Wow. Man, man, I said, he's homeless, but he's proud, man. He's got some dignity, man. He had some chicken right there by the side. What does he need 50 cents for? Man? Hey, hey, people, we're all screwed up, but we still got pride, right? We need to get rid of that. We need to let the Lord treat that. We don't need the pride. But guess what happened? He went down to the Jordan River. He, didn't want, to, he wanted to go back to Syria. He said, I'm they're going down to that dirt, dirty river, man. We got two clean rivers in Damascus, Syria, that are crystal clear, that run through the city and feed the pools in the city. The Parfar River. Why should I go down there to this dirty river? And, it, and his servant goes, but if he would have asked you to do something great and splendorous in the field of battle, wouldn't you do it? Well, yeah. Well, what's so big about going down to the Jordan River? Because I got to let go of my pride. And he goes, what's better? 
Get rid of your pride or get rid of your leprosy. Oh, you got a point. So he kept his royal gowns on, walked into the Jordan, sank down in that dirty river. A dead chicken slapped him in the head. Got back up, he shook it off, took a feather out of his mouth, ducked back again, nothing happened. Dug back again, nothing happened. Dug back again. He said, forget it, I'm walking. Don't walk out. Dug back the fifth time, nothing happened. Dug down the sixth time. A dead cow smacked him on the side of the body. Went back one more time and came up clean. He went back to Elisha's house. He said, don't you want this money? He goes, no, you can't buy a miracle. You cannot buy a miracle. Miracles come from the grace of God. And miracles point to God. No miracle in your life is an end in itself. Miracles happen to change our mind about our pride and to give God the glory in our life. From the kitchen to the bedroom, from the bedroom to the garage. He came out and he looked at Elisha and he said, now I know that there's no God like the God of Israel. And today, he will be my God and I will be his slave. But Elisha, will you pray for me? Because the king is so old that he wants me to go to worship with him in the house of Rimon the idol God of Syria. Will you pray that my God will forgive me when he leans on me in that temple to pray? And Elisha said, go your way. You know what he did? He filled the camels with dirt from Israel and put sacks of dirt, not sacks of gold or silver, not sacks of riches, but sacks of dirt from Israel to go back to Syria and build Syria the first altar to the creator of the heavens and the earth. Do you think that the Lord sent that little girl there for nothing? No. Do you think that the little children coming to VBS will be coming here for nothing? No. Don't underestimate the faith of a baby that at the right moment, at the right time, shared the faith in God to her Lord. Now, let me tell you what. The whole time God wanted, not just for her to share it, but God's purpose for sending her there was so that Naaman the general would bring faith to the palace of Syria. She was a witness to the power of Jesus, just like any child that comes through here this week will be. And I want you to involve yourself in VBS. I want you to leave this day with two or three or four little neighbors in mind that you could bring to know the Lord. Don't be lazy either. You go to the laundromat, you see the lady with the family, invite them to VBS. Tomorrow, here. 6.30 to 8.30. Be here or be square. 